Good evening, everyone. Welcome. So nice to see you all. I see some familiar faces. I'm uh, Anna Chodos. I'm the co-chair of the course and uh, currently an assistant professor in the Division of Geriatrics in the Department of Medicine here. And I'm very pleased to present this evening with my colleague, Dr. Linda Mackin. Um, just briefly like to introduce her. She's gonna present with me. We're gonna go back and forth uh, to talk this evening with you about myths of aging. Oh, also just briefly, Linda is a nurse practitioner and PhD nurse in our School of Nursing and an experienced educator uh, and professor here at our um, university. So um, it's really a pleasure to, to present with her. Um, we had a lot of fun putting this together. I hope it's really enjoyable and informative. So I'm going to get us started. This is our menu for the evening. These are the myths we're going to talk about. It's probably somewhat obvious, but I just wanted to restate what a myth is. A myth is a wild, widely held, or wildly as well, but widely held, but false belief or idea. So most of what you're seeing here is actually false, and that's what we're gonna talk about. So the first myth is that older people are either super healthy or super frail. We kind of have these two images of what it's like to be an older person. The second is that you are completely responsible for how well you age. We learned a little bit about the aging biology last week, and so maybe you can draw on some of that, but we'll talk a little bit more about sort of what's true and what's not about that. Third is older people will eventually lose their memory. Fourth is most older people will end up in nursing homes. And fifth is, there's nothing to look forward to in older age. I didn't create these widely held beliefs. I am just stating them here. So I thought I would get started actually with a little bit of why we decided to include this topic. There's been some really important work in the last three years done by a group called the Frameworks Institute in collaboration with multiple organizations that do aging research and aging policy. And they were hired, they're a MacArthur Genius Organization awarded for their work in framing and understanding cultural issues. And in this case, they were asked to work on aging. And so they have multiple reports on reframing aging and how it's time to reframe the way we think about aging. And I just wanted to share some of their insights. There's they have multiple publications on this, they're all incredibly interesting. Unfortunately, it turns out it's not super easy to just reframe aging. It's actually a little complicated and involved. Mostly what they've done is produce a set of communication tools that we can use to talk about aging differently so that people's views shift a little bit, that the paradigm shifts a little bit in how we think about and communicate about aging. But one thing they did that I thought was really interesting is talk about the swamp. So they identify cultural norms and ideas, and then characterize that as a swamp. The reason they characterize that as a swamp is that there are some beautiful, lush things about a swamp, but there are a lot of hiding and not always visible at the surface, dangerous things lurking below. And they use this image of a swamp to remind us that when we're communicating about aging or other issues, they use this this framing um, in other areas as well. But when you're communicating about aging, what's in that swamp? So what do you want to try not to put your, what snapping alligators do you want to try to avoid, basically? And what's fascinating is they do a lot of interviews and they do a lot of cultural analysis, media analysis, to understand what are the dominant ideas in this swamp. So what they found when it comes to aging is that people, when you talk to them, have at once, so I'm gonna start over here on the top left, they at once have ideas about aging, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that are both idealized and what they perceive to be real, and they're somewhat, uh, they clash a little bit. So a lot of the idealized views of aging that are out there are about the fact that older people have a lot of accumulated wisdom, that they can be self-sufficient and active, and that they've earned their leisure, that they're spending time at the country club or whatever because they've earned it. So those are some of the ideal versions of aging that people think about and, and look forward to. On the other hand, when you ask them what they think people are actually experiencing in older age, 
they've deteriorated physically, they don't have as much control over their lives, they're dependent upon others, and this is a determined outcome. There's not a lot they can do about it. At the same time, they put a lot of emphasis on how individual how individuals really own the aging process and how their lifestyle choices and maybe their financial choices affected how they were able to experience older age and how they're able to live in older age. They see threats in our modern life to the experience of aging, so families aren't as close physically. Uh, People live on fixed incomes, economics is harder, and the really predominant view that Social Security is doomed and um, that's, a, that's a looming threat for older people. There's consistently an us versus them kind of talk. So older people are othered very much. Um, they're not part of the rest of us. There's a zero sum, meaning it's us against them. So other generations are sort of in conflict with the older generations. And um, there's a real us versus them in the digital uh, world that older people are really incompetent in technology and digital devices. What are some of the solutions that people think are possible that uh, that individuals can make better choices and plan better? That's one way they could have control. That they could learn more and be better educated. So that's something we could do as a society to help them. But actually, a lot of times, it's a really fatalistic view. There's nothing you can do to really improve the way your people are going to age. I'm not saying any of this is true. I'm saying this is the cultural analysis. And I actually only had to look at one magazine to find examples of all of this. So I just want to share with you some magazine covers from Time Magazine in the last 30 to 40 years. So 1970, Growing Old in America, the Unwanted Generation. So that's a very fatalistic, that's a very us versus them, zero sum. That's a very um, uh, dependent or uh, unwelcome message, I would say. Old age, how to help our parents. Again, dependency, othering. Just makes me wonder, like, is nobody who's an older person reading their magazine? Is that what they think? Um, And now for the fun years. Americans are, this is 1988, Americans are living longer and enjoying it more. This is the earned leisure idea. But who will foot the bill? (laughs) So again, this us versus them, generations are warring. And I don't know what Dole was doing, but he's on a roll in 1988. (laughs) Now we get to the um, sort of immortal um, wishful thinking that There's not anything we can do, but science is gonna help us not age, right? So we're gonna stay forever young, says the supermodel, who in 1996 um, is their example of science, searching for ways to keep us forever young. I think they're also alluding to the fountain of youth here. She's in a pool of water. Can Google solve death? So I don't know how many of you have read articles about Google's efforts. They hired, I believe, a really prominent UCSF scientist to work on some of this. I think it's Calico is their venture to focus on the science of the anti-aging science. This was very recent and um, how to live longer better. So this says the anti-aging supplements experts take. I don't take any supplements, I just want to say. Uh, Pray, the benefits, the health benefits of faith, the world's healthiest places. So there's been a lot of focus on areas in the world where people live longer than others, often called blue zones. And then, and the asterisks, how to live longer better and still have fun. (laughs) So obviously that wasn't, nobody assumed that that was included originally in getting older. (laughs) So you had to put an asterisk there. And then actually this is from the future, May 28th, How My Generation Broke America. And this is Stephen Brill. He's putting out a book, um, and I actually can't remember the title, uh, about how the baby boomers and their the way that they've now structured economic life and political life have broken America. And I also enjoy that right under here is Next Generation Leaders Reshaping the World. So it's always a focus on young people reshaping the world, which they do, it's wonderful, or next generation leaders, I guess I shouldn't say they're all young. But it, 
it's like this additional subtle othering or distinction between older people and the baby boomer generation and people who are actually changing the world apparently. So I just wanna, this is just an introduction into why we wanted to talk about some of these myths. They're really out there actually as a field. We're trying really hard to use what we know and what we do in working with older people and the research that we do to counter some of these myths. Um, and I forgot, I can never resist the silver tsunami. So that one is super popular, it's everywhere. It, a million news articles start with, you know, as the silver tsunami approaches, and so this is one article from May 7th, Startups See Opportunity in Silver Tsunami. As boomers retire, Valley businesses brace for the silver tsunami. So I, it's just, it, it's literally making us terrified of older people getting older, that this is a natural disaster. And there's nobody who says, hey, there's a tsunami coming, let's all hug and hug the tsunami. It's let's run the other way. So as an image, the silver tsunami is a really unfortunate one. So let's get to the myths. Some information about these myths and why they're wrong. So older people are either super healthy or super frail. So this was an article I saw a couple of years ago about a gentleman, Charles, I actually can't say his last name properly, probably, Ugister, uh, the greatest British sprinter you've probably never heard of, currently holds world records in the 200 meter indoor, 400 meter outdoor sprints, as well as British records in the 60 meter indoor, 100 meter outdoor, and 200 meter outdoor. A couple of weeks ago, he narrowly missed out on the world record for the 60 meter sprint after pulling his hamstring halfway through. He still won the race to become European champion. It's an impressive record, given that the man, by pretty well-established standards, shouldn't be able to cross a road without help, let alone run. He is 96 years old. So yes, a remarkable human being. This is exactly the, the folks that newspapers love to report on, people love to do stories on. Of course, this is remarkable at any age to be a world champion. And this gentleman was incredibly athletic most of his life with long life, so various 20-year hiatuses. Um, but his life story is very interesting, and he actually had wonderful things to say about getting older and how he's been treated as an older person. But it's just to point out that here he is, you know, here he is, this great accomplishment, and they have to, it, they want to celebrate his age, but at the same time kind of take a dig and point out that other 96-year-olds apparently can't cross the street. And I just, frankly, I haven't seen that study. <laughs> um, so what do we know about older people? Are they either super frail, can't cross the street, or competing in European championships? Actually, no. So this is a growth chart for kids. So what do you do with kids? You follow, you track their growth, and that's how you know if they're on track. There is no such thing for older people. So the thing that really sticks out about older people is heter what we call heterogeneity. They're incredibly different for a chronicologic age. We do not focus on age because it isn't that helpful. So this is, the guy on the left is a San Francisco resident and he's a beneficiary of a program here that was working with him and he agreed to have his picture taken. And, on, and so that's a local gentleman. And on the right are people roughly 20 years older who do swimming in cold water every day. And, um, and he's actually basically homebound. So I think, and 20 years they're junior. So that is to say that if I'm looking at an age, I don't know if you are, I, that tells me nothing about how you can get through a day and what, what you're capable of physically and cognitively. I need to know more about you as a person. And the, the main thing is that really um, we cannot chart where you're supposed to be based on your age. And we're really trying to understand better how to categorize um, who really needs certain interventions in terms of some of the anti, um, you know, certain anti-disease or pro-function interventions versus um, just, you know, doing cutoffs by age. So for example, you could imagine that one thing that really gets complicated for us is cancer screening. So cancer screening is usually based on age cutoffs. And the problem is age cutoffs don't actually tell you about how long that person will will likely get benefit from the intervention you're giving them, especially as they get older. The heterogene heterogeneity gets bigger. So we often like to know more about our folks, um, and I'll get to that a little bit more. The other thing we know is that, especially here, we have a bigger diversity 
of older people than we ever have before. So not just heterogeneity, meaning there's a difference in function and health and socioeconomic circumstances, but actually just cultural background. So um, what this graph shows is that as our older population grows, 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 this is the total number going up to 2060, the number of native born will get quite a bit smaller um, over time and kind of almost flatten, and the foreign born will become a larger proportion. So they are growing at almost 300 percent between 2015 and 2060, whereas native born older adults in, as part of our population are growing about 76 percent. So it's just a greater diversity and more fun to work in geriatrics. Um, and, but why are people so different? So why, is, why do you really want everybody to be the same by a number of key markers when they're three and you have no idea how they're doing functionally or in terms of um, their health when they're 80, um, just based on age? It's really because if you think about it, when you're older, you're really experiencing cumulative effects of multiple things that affect your health and well-being. So the things that most commonly affect how you're doing when you're older are how you're functioning and things that may help or hurt your function, like do you live on a big hill? Do you have 45 stairs? Um, do you have a really, um, really small kitchen? Um, do you have caregiving responsibilities? That has a big impact on people's lives and function. What's your social network? Social network changes a lot over a lifetime. Life events, these are unpredictable things like partners dying or major illnesses, chronic conditions that you have to deal with every day, economic opportunities that may have been in your control may not have been, especially women have a lot of coming in and out of the workforce or the women who are older now have had a lot of economic opportunity variability over a lifetime. And then what was your access to healthcare over a lifetime? So all of these things, when they meet a person who's an individual person has a different genetic makeup and, and health makeup and susceptibility to different illnesses or ways that your well-being might be affected. When it comes into contact with all these things, all these different variables over a lifetime, um, people are going to look very different at 80 and have different function and abilities and, again, um, health. So just briefly, to sort of address this idea, if we are going to lump old, all older people together, are they mostly healthy or mostly not? And mostly, they're healthy. So this, was a, this is a national health interview survey. It's not, um, it's not a direct survey, but it's a, it's a phone survey that's done um, every year in the days av available. But the most recently, where they sort of aggregated people over 65 in terms of chronic illnesses and healthy, most reported being healthy. The other is um, here in California, most older people, 72%, have reported that their health is good to excellent, which is the same as, as middle-aged, um, roughly the same. And so I guess I just wanted to, to sit for a minute with the fact that we really try to focus on um, not necessarily the list of chronic conditions or the list of um, medicines, but how people feel that they're doing and how they're able to get through their day. So how do we sort of quantify how people get through their day and how well they're able to? I keep using this word function, and so I want to define it for a second. Um, so this is a little detour. Um, function for us in the health world, where we, and the so often in the social services world, when we're working usually um, with older people, is to ask about these things. And these are um, sort of basic. I think most of you are going to think these are pretty basic if I'm asking how well you're functioning during a day. But we, we split it into, and forgive me for not spelling this out, um, instrumental activities of daily living, the IADLs, and activities of daily living. So the IADLs um, are usually as people start to need maybe need some help or lose some function as they get older, um, if they lose any function, these tend to be impacted earlier because they can be a little more um, uh, complicated or have more moving parts. But I also now sort of think of these as the app functions. So your phone has an app for a lot of these things at this point. But taking medicines, doing housework, actually preparing food, doing your finances, doing shopping, 
using a phone and using uh, transportation or driving. These are all considered instrumental activities of daily living. So these are really things you need to be independent outside of your home. Activities of daily living are often impacted much later in a disability course or um, later in life. And these often, um, although it depends on, on what particular conditions you might have, because you could imagine you would have like a oh, you know, bad shoulder or something like that that might affect some of this. But these are the things that you need to be independent in your home. So if you could get an app to bring you all of this or to get you around um, and to do your, help you do your bills and remind you to take your medications, um, this is what you would need to be independent in, like behind your front door safely. So that is bathing, dressing, being able to toilet independently uh, or maintain um, hygiene if you're incontinent. Transferring from a bed to a chair, chair to um, chair to, to standing, and then feeding yourself. So a lot of people do really well, have a good quality of life, even if they're impacted in a lot of their IADLs, and um, and are independent in their home. Um, but once somebody has a an a disability in ADL. I'll just say it's usually my focus to make sure I know that they're getting some assistance with that to maintain independence in the community. It doesn't mean you know, they need to leave the home. It just means I, you, know, you want to make sure they have some assistance. But how many people actually have this disability? So really it's about a third um, of folks have, we usually say around 30% have a self-care dif difficulty, like an um, activity of daily living. And so this is sort of an aggregate of different ones. They didn't, this is the American Community Survey, and they didn't actually parse it out by the ones I just showed you. They added a, a couple more. But, but am, between ambulation and self-care and um, some independent living difficulty, it's usually about a third um, have some disability over age 65. Um, about 9% have a cognitive difficulty, vision 7%, hearing 15%. And that's actually probably a low estimate if it, it's probably including only severe hearing difficulty. But these are all the things that, these to me don't seem like barriers to living in the community. It's just something you want to detect and know about because you can do something about it. But it is by no means the majority of older people. The other thing too is what I find really interesting when we think of how are people super healthy or super frail or how do we think about older people in our communities. The, Working and being older is increasingly common. So it's really important to think about older people and their ability to adapt to work environments and be um, accepted and integrated into work environments. And so people over 65 are the fastest growing sector of the labor um, force. And part of that we know is economic, that people don't feel like they can retire as early. But part of that is definitely that people are robust and want to be working and are working. However, what does it mean to work as an older person? I think I just wanted to highlight some really interesting examples, particularly of late. Well, one that I always love is Betty Reed Soskin. Do you know her? Yeah, of course. OK, she's a celebrity. But she's our 96-year-old park ranger in Richmond at the uh, Rosie the Riveter um, Park. Do you guys know this gentleman? I'm going to totally botch his name. It's um, Matahir Muhammad. He was, he's just been elected the prime minister of Malaysia. He had a long run in the 80s and I think to 2000 as their prime minister, and now he's 93. I was just elected a couple of weeks ago as their prime minister. Um, and these folks are anonymous. They are a Google search. But the point is, they are in my mind, working, they're providing childcare. There's a lot of support that increasingly people receive from other generations, uh, not parents, but grandparents, or even above, great-grandparents. I have some patients who as great-grandparents are taking care of their great-grandchildren. Um, and um, I think not seeing them in the labor force is one thing, and that's certainly increasingly common, like technically post-retirement age. But then also the fact that many older people do a lot of work in the, you know, for our community, for our society, even as, um, as post-retirement. Okay, so Dr. Mackin's going to take over here for a few myths. So I'm going to handle myths number two, three, and four. 
So number two is that you are completely responsible for how well you age. By raise of hand, how many people here think that's true? Okay, all right. Okay, we got, we got a few hands here. And on what basis does anybody want to throw out an, yes? A lot of diseases and disabilities are lifestyle choices. Okay, all right, so I just need to repeat this uh, for the recording. Um, the audience uh, member said that a lot of people's illnesses are related to lifestyle choices. So habits and environment and maybe things that they've done during their life, right? And so that therefore makes you responsible for how well you age or not. Anybody else have anything else to add to that? Yes. Uh, every day is like keep on learning and keep your mind sharp. Okay. Okay, good, thank you. So the comment was to keep yourself sharp. You want to every day try to learn new things and try to incorporate more uh, knowledge into your fund of knowledge that you have, and that keeps you more vigorous. Yes, good, I agree with that, yes. So I'm gonna talk about um, myth number two relative to longevity, and I'll tell you the reason why is that um, I had four family members who were part of the New England Centenarian study, so I know quite a bit about that study and the results from it. Anybody here in the room um, have any family members or anyone that's associated with the New England Centenarian study? No? So my grandmother and three of her siblings were all enrolled. They have all since passed away, but my grandmother lived to be 105. Um, her baby sisters were 103 and 102, respectively, uh, when they passed, and their brother was 101 when he passed. He was actually the first one to enter the study, and then when he entered the study, the um, coordinators of the New England Centenarian Study reached out to him and said, do you have any siblings? Well, yes, I do. At that point, he was the oldest, so all of the, the sisters were still in their 90s, but they enrolled everybody. And as part of the enrollment, um, blood was drawn so that they have banked genetic tissue and, and blood um, uh, composition and, and um, information on all of the people that were enrolled in these studies. And the New England Centenarian Study started collecting data around 1994. And um, what, some of the major things that have come out of the centenarian study is that genetics is probably the most important factor in predicting or determining if you're gonna make it to 100 or not. And in fact, I, I meant to put this on the slide. Um, in the New England Centenarian Study website, there is a little side box where you can click a survey that will tell you what your chances are of making it to 100. I actually do it in my classes uh, with my nursing students and we have a lot of fun and then we report back to each other about how we were doing and we feel sad for those that say they're not gonna make it to 100. Did you have a question, sir? There's a picture in the paper today, a woman 113, full functioning, bright, alert, well-dressed, mobile, working puzzles, and so forth. Yes. And 113. Yes, yes. She might be the oldest woman in America, or close to it. Yes, probably very, very close to it. So I just want to repeat what um, this gentleman said is that there was an article in the paper today about a woman who's 113 years old who's still very much together uh, cognitively and, and functionally and, and looked great, you said. Yes, great, good, thanks for um, sharing that. So they're a really unique um, group of people. Um, but they have found that there are actually genetic signatures, so they have looked at all of this genetic data that they've collected through the years of um, data collection for the centenarian study, and they have identified sort of clusters or patterns of specific genes that seem to help people to better um, achieve that goal, if that's your goal, or to achieve an age of 100. Um, so they call those the genetic signatures. Um, to contrast this, in my own family with what um, this gentleman said about uh, lifestyle and environment, my family members sort of demonstrated the effect or not of that. So as I said, all four of them made it to be over 100. My grandmother, 105, was the longest living, 
And um, I can remember growing up, she was making her own yogurt long before anybody ever even thought to sell yogurt in the grocery store. And, and, and as a kid, we were all gagging. I didn't want to eat grandma's um, yogurt. And in fact, she was a member at the Olympic Club and played golf there until she was around 96 or 97. And um, she would pick mushrooms off of that golf course and said that she knew better than anybody else which ones were poisonous and which weren't. But whenever grandma prepared a salad for the family, nobody wanted to eat it if it had mushrooms in it for obvious reasons. So we, we weren't really certain that she knew exactly what she was doing with selecting her mushrooms. But she did not die from mu mushroom poisoning, so she, she did know what she was doing. <laughs> Um, she also used to put a uh, wheat germ in everything that she baked. So she would bake like grandma um, oatmeal cookies, but it had wheat germ in it. And as kids, we bite into it and we're thinking this is going to be nice and buttery and juicy. And it was like eating sawdust. So um, anyhow, she was very much into nutrition. Um, she also swam almost every day. Um, so she, she made it to 105. In contrast, her sister, who lived over in Oakland, um, passed away just shy of 103. And she called herself a couch potato, hated exercise, didn't want to have anything to do with exercise, and literally lived off of Stouffer's frozen dinners <laughs> and could talk for hours about which ones were the best. So she made it over 100, too. And then um, the uh, one sister lived in Portland. She's the one that made it to 103. She was driving until I think she was like 100. And apparently, she drove one of those Cadillac DeVilles that was like a block long. And I guess she knew how to park it, which you know tells you something about her function, right? And then uh, the brother, who lived to be 101, he had a pacemaker. Um, and uh, I didn't have a lot of uh, contact with him during my life, but he, I believe he got married a few times, and one time, or the last time, was in his 90s, um, and uh, he was quite vigorous up until the moment that he, he passed at 101. So there's kind of a wide range just within my own family of the effect of um, their, their lifestyle and their habits, um, so it kind of comes back to the genes. And that's what they're seeing from uh, the centenarian study. Um, in doing some uh, reading in preparation for this presentation, I came across two concepts here that I wanted to share with you because I think it kind of helps to tie some things in here, particularly around the value of function and the importance of function. So a, uh, a scientist down at Stanford, James Fries, um, came up with the compression of morbidity hypothesis. And this was back, in, I think, in the 1990s. And his hypothesis was that people who made it to advanced age were able to shorten the period of their life where they actually had chronic illnesses that affected their function and, and um, uh, longevity. The folks who have um, contributed to the research that's in the centenarian study took that hypothesis and worked it a little bit more to call it compression of disability. And what they have found is that people who make it to over 100 have just the same amount of chronic illness as younger people. If you sort of compare people that make it to 100 and those who don't, it's not like the people over 100 have fewer illnesses. They have many of the same illnesses that younger people who don't make it to 100 also have. But they are able to compress the disability associated with those illnesses until very, very late in life. Therefore, they're able to function more independently. And they came up with three sort of labels for these people uh, relative to the compression of disability. And one is the survivors. So these are people that have had uh, chronic illness that was evident before age 80. The delayers are the people that had the chronic illnesses starting in their 80s, but they were able to delay the uh, compression of the disability or the impact that it had on their function until later. And then the escapers are people in their 90s who um, didn't really seem to have much disability related to their illness at all. And another interesting thing that they found in the centenarian study is that at age 93, 90% of the people in their cohort that they were studying were functionally independent. 90% of the 93-year-olds. So that, again, really supports this notion that it really is 
all about function. And um, for all the years that uh, my family members were enrolled in the study, while they were still alive, there was an annual interview and a survey that was uh, completed, and it had to do with how well are they doing, how much help do they need with things like the ADLs and the IADLs. Um, there were some measures of their um, uh, memory function um, and where they were living and how much help they needed to get through the day, as well as medications, chronic illnesses, hospitalizations, things like that. So they have a really rich database, and I think some really interesting things have come from that, um, and I think we have a lot more to look forward to. Um, going along with our myth is uh, to debunk this myth, uh, that, uh, oh, you're responsible for your own aging, right? <laughs> um, more older adults are doing activities. So this is a, um, a graph showing um, self-reported activity, both aerobic activity on the left-hand side and muscle strengthening activity on the right. And the dark blue represents people who responded to the survey between year 2000 and 2002. The light blue is later um, people who responded between 2013 and 2015. And you can see across the board, the, the respondents in the later time cohort um, are self-reporting more. But um, as we age, it does sort of decline in terms of uh, the percentage of people who are reporting aerobic activity um, and muscle strengthening activity, including um, in the oldest old cohort, which are people 85 and up, for the most recent data for muscle strengthening, less than 10% or around 10% are doing that right now. So there's a lot of room uh, for um, boosting these, the height of these bar graphs in here uh, to help support function. Okay, but it is a myth that older people will eventually lose their memory. And if you look into this a little bit, you'll find a lot of um, sort of statements out there, but the one that I use the most is at age 85, half of the people will have some cognitive impairment. That's doesn't, it's not equivalent to dementia, and half will not. So I've seen that number, the age sort of move up and down, but in, that's kind of a ballpark figure. So memory loss is common in aging, but I really want to emphasize that it's not normal. And this is something that I um, try to uh, remind my students because I think it's easy when you work uh, with older people to fall into this rut of thinking, well, everybody has some cognitive impairment and that that's just part of aging when it is not. So it's memory loss is common. As I said, about the 85-year-olds, 50% will and 50% will not, but it is not a normal part of aging. And there are some expected cognitive changes, and I put a short list here, but these are the ones that are most commonly uh, described. There is a decline in processing speed, meaning that you're not able to um, process uh, thought um, as quickly as you would when you were younger. There is also a decreased ability to multitask. Um, and uh, an activity of daily living that's very important that requires multitasking is driving. So um, that's why it, it's important to be aware of these changes with uh, older drivers or family members that are aging and driving because um, there's also a redu reduction in reaction speed from a neurological standpoint. That can impact driving safety as well. The ability to learn is preserved, um, but it may take a little more effort. It may take a little more time to get things to sink in, but one can always learn. And just as I had mentioned this dividing line at age 85, half have cognitive impairment, half do not, we have this other dividing line when we talk about people that have memory or cognitive impairment. And we have sort of two very broad categories. One is called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. And then we have a global term of dementia. And Alzheimer's disease being the most common form of dementia. But the term dementia actually has many, many different types of cognitive impairments um, underneath that umbrella. And the thing that differentiates mild cognitive impairment versus dementia is in mild cognitive impairment, there may be some memory problems that are detected through some assessments or screenings, but the impairment does not interfere with the person's function. 
they can still perform their activities of daily living. They are still fairly independent with their activities, uh, instrumental activities of daily living. Whereas with dementia, there are functional impairments. And quite often they are in the activity of daily living category, the toileting, the um, transferring, um, those of which I like to um, think of those as needing a warm body to help you to perform those. And I love what you said, Anna, about the app side uh, for the IADLs. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind is that um, when memory impairment impacts function, then we're talking about something under the category of dementia and not just mild cognitive impairment. Does anybody want to guess at what is represented in the picture? That's an early hearing aid, yes? And thank you to the few people that laughed. I love to include this picture, but I hardly ever get anybody laughing at it. But I, I think it's pretty funny. Um, but it does remind me to say that if you ever need to improve your hearing instantaneously, just pull your ears forward like this, like he's doing, and it really improves your hearing. That's what elephants do, and so we can do it too. We can use our own hands to do it. Um, so. A really important um, thing to think about when somebody, um, as they age, for all of us who are aging, but particularly if somebody seems to be having some cognitive or memory impairment, is are there some things that can be fixed from a sens sensory standpoint? So hearing being one. I've seen a number of people in my practice who have been sort of labeled as having cognitive impairment when actually it's just that they cannot hear. Um, and um, similarly, people, if they don't have good vision correction or they have problems with cataracts that have not been um, treated, that will influence their ability to perform some of these assessments that we do in order to determine if there is any indication of memory impairment. So we always need to be aware that sensory function does decline as we get older, hearing ability does decline as we get older, it's probably a normal part of aging, and there are normal changes that occur with vision as well, some of which we can correct, some we cannot. But if we want to optimize somebody's cognition um, and ability to participate in their life, we need to make sure that the sensory function is intact. Another thing that turns out to be helpful in being able to maintain um, a good cognitive uh, function is dependent upon how big your personal fund of knowledge is. So to put it very generally, if you are somebody who is fairly knowledgeable, educated, then it's going to be longer before your cognitive losses are going to have a significant impact on your function and also may make any cognitive problems less detectable to other people because you are working with so much knowledge to begin with. Illness burden. So we know that um, older people often will start collecting um, chronic health problems. So it's not uncommon for older people to have high cholesterol or high blood pressure or diabetes. And I see in older adults that sometimes all of these diseases start to gang up on you because one sort of kind of feeds into the other one. So that can also impact uh, your, um, your memory function and cognition, as well as the medications that we use to treat some of these problems can do that as well. And then as we've talked about a little bit, habits and lifestyles do influence um, our memory. So just for a very general, um, Example, we know that drinking alcohol is not good for the brain. Neither is it good for our liver, but it's not good for the brain. And so um, uh, smoking is the same because it has all of the negative effects with our vascular system. So when I'm thinking about um, memory, um, I think it's useful to know what the risk factors are for memory impairment and cognitive impairment. and look at the list of risk factors, although recognize that we can't do anything about any of them except maybe protecting um, younger people from head injury. But age is the biggest risk factor for developing dementia or cognitive impairment. There are some forms of dementia that run in, run in families. 
There are some specific genes that are associated with the development of um, dementias, and then as I mentioned about head injuries. But there are some factors that can help reduce the risk, and those are really well um, uh, exemplified by the folks who are in the Wizard of Oz story. So I was thinking about this last night. I don't think, and you can help me if, I, if I'm not getting this right, I don't think along their yellow brick road trip they ate anything. Does anybody remember that? I don't remember that. So we're just going to assume, because they were able to complete their journey, that they ate a healthy diet. They did not smoke or drink during their journey. However, they did fall asleep in a field of poppies. Do you remember that? And I don't remember if it was the whole um, group or if it was just one or two of them. But um, So they did, they did have some exploration with that. We can, we can give them that. They got plenty of exercise for their bodies as they journeyed along the yellow brick road. And they probably did their heart and brain a lot of good through that exercise. But they also had members of this group that were seeking heart and brain. And which one of the characters is the one that wanted a heart? The Tin Man wanted a heart. He did not have one, yes. And who needed a brain desperately? The Scarecrow, right. And so this gives me the um, opportunity to say that in um, healthcare, and particularly in talking about um, maintaining health, we say whatever is good for the heart is good for the brain. So a heart-healthy diet and lifestyle with exercise, avoiding smoking, um, controlling cholesterol, watching the salt intake, um, eating a you know Mediterranean uh, DASH diet um, is beneficial not only to the heart but also to the brain. And then finally, coming back to our um, our Wizard of Oz characters, they all benefited from the social support that they got from each other. And we know that that's something that's helpful for um, all of us, but particularly as we age and helping to keep our cognition and our, our memory um, working as best as it can through social support. And we'll move on to myth number four, most older people will end up in nursing homes. And, and I was thinking as, as Anna was going through all of these, you might not believe it, but we actually tried to word these in a more positive way. We had a different list that was even more of a downer than what we have on this, right, Anna? We had to sort that out the other night. Um, this is a myth. Fortunately, most older people will not end up in nursing homes, but I have some information just about who does live in nursing homes. Um, most of the residents in long-term care um, are older adults, about 63%, but a good portion, more than a third of the people that are recipients of long-term care are under the age of 65. And just keep in mind for this particular study, um, long-term care included hospice care, nursing home, uh, people who are receiving home health nursing, and people who reside in residential care communities, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Um, according to data collected in 2010, only 13% of Americans age 85 or older resided in an institution. So that might be a nursing home or a residential care facility. Um, and only 1% of people in a younger age cohort. Um, and then I, I, I just have to kind of laugh at this stat. It says 25% of people admitted stay only a short time, which is defined as three months or less. That sounds like a long time to me to be in, in an institution. So. I guess that we should be happy it's only 25%, but three months or more sounds long to me. The lifetime risk of needing a uh, nursing home uh, varies depending upon what age cohort you're in, but in the younger cohort, about half of those will spend at least one night in a nursing home over a lifetime. Now, here's another thing that's kind of amusing about this stat is I don't know if anybody that's ever spent one night in a nursing home. So I, I think we can sort of question these stats a little bit. <laughs> I mean, the last slide just said you might be there for three months, and that's not very long. So I don't know. We'll just sort of take it for what it is. Um, we had somebody help us with the research stats on this, so I <laughs> have to say I'm not totally clear on it. But, um, but the lifetime risk of being in a nursing home is at about 43%, uh, so almost half. 
And people aged um, in the younger age cohort have a 10% chance of spending three years or more in a nursing home and a 5% chance of spending more than four years. So um, I should educate myself more about this study because there are some sort of interesting findings in there. So uh, you probably can read that up there. I was hoping maybe you couldn't. But um, raise your hand if you think that Medicare pays for long-term care and assistance with daily living. Oh, nobody's going to do it now. I should have rearranged this slide a little bit. You're, you're very um, on the ball with your knowledge here, but uh, about half of the people um, polled thought that, um, that Medicare will pay, and, and Medicare does not. There's very specific things that Medicare will pay for under kind of the umbrella of long-term care, um, and it's not much. Um, and then uh, these pie charts show, um, on the one on the left says, does a typical health insurance plan pay for ongoing care in a nursing home? And these were people that were uh, 40 years and older, and more than half said no, so they were correct on that. And then does a typical health insurance plan pay for ongoing care at home by a licensed home health aide? And about half said no, and they were correct on that too. So. Um, it appears that people increasingly are beginning to understand uh, that Medicare does not pay much for uh, long-term care, and particularly for custodial care. They do not pay for that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about different kinds of um, living settings for older adults, just so we all have kind of a common understanding of that. Um, we've talked a little bit about nursing homes. That's Again, sort of an umbrella term. Underneath that might be a skilled nursing or a um, subacute might be sort of categorized underneath a nursing home, but they actually have different um, uh, levels of service that's provided. But really, people that reside in a nursing home are kind of a small sli slice of the pie. Um, what's very um, becoming increasingly more common and expanding all the time are residential care communities. And the data that I found was, was kind of old from 2014. They said there was 30,000 of these in the country, um, reflecting uh, one million beds and more than three quarters of a million people living in these uh, facilities. And in general, these are assisted living facilities of which they pop up all over the place. These are, for a large part, uh, corporate owned. So some of the brand names are like Sunrise and Atria and uh, Silverado. Um, and then we have also board and care homes, which are typically homes in a residential community, um, a single family home that's been converted to accommodate about six residents. And uh, there'll be staff um, in the home at all times to provide personal care and assistance and, and uh, um, medications. Assisted living and board and care are things that Medicare does not pay for. Um, in very limited situations, Medi-Cal may help support somebody who needs to live in a board and care home, or if somebody needs to live in a board and care home and they're getting um, Social Security insurance, they may get a little bit more in their monthly SSI in order to cover the cost of a board and care. And then the third, and again, Medicare is never going to pay for this, active adult communities. And so these are the communities where you typically buy your own home or you buy equity into the um, community. There's 151 of these in California and there's 15 in the Bay Area. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of one in a minute, but I wanted to step away from this topic for just a second to just share an interesting stat here. So according to the U.S. Census, the oldest county in the United States is Sumter County, Florida, where the average age is 66.6 .6 years. So if you want to move somewhere where you're going to have a lot of company in your, your later uh, uh, decades, that's where you want to go. And part of the reason why they are on top is because that's the home of the Villages Retirement Community. Have you heard of the Villages? So. The, the Village's retirement community is this community in Sumter County, Florida. Um, and it's one of the original active adult communities. And they dub it the Disney World for adults. And that is largely why that county comes out with the highest average age, is because this is such a big 
draw in that county. And this is um, kind of a petri dish for older adult research because they have so many people there in this community. Just a uh, little travel log information for you. And then um, I'm kind of skipping around a little bit, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to tell you a little bit about a couple of resources that may be helpful if you or a loved one are uh, facing um, selection of a nursing home. Uh, Medicare has a uh, national database called Nursing Home Compare that's updated monthly. And you can look up any nursing home in the country and see how they're doing in terms of staffing, inspections, what have they been in trouble for, things like that. And then um, in California, we have a really great advocacy group called CANAR, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. They have a really great website, um, and they take very seriously the importance of advocating for um, long-term care um, individuals and also um, to make sure that, uh, that families and patients are supported um, if they find themselves needing to use long-term care. Okay, I'll hand it back to Anna. Thanks for allowing me to return. Um, I will say actually briefly about Canner, I'm a huge fan. I use their resources all the time. I will say they have actually, I think, an unfortunate website in terms of it's just not very user-friendly um, or it's a little messy. But, and their name is a little bit terrible because they do everything. They do all elder law and they're just actually a great resource if you need an elder law attorney or um, any sort of just generic information about resources or nursing homes or um, any kind of uh, legal assistance. And they have links to lawyers. So I use them all the time actually. Uh, they're a terrific resource. So. Our last one, there's nothing to look forward to in older age, except maybe, you know, not having to live through too many more elections, I don't know. Um, but turns out this is a myth, thank goodness for all of us. So debunked happiness. There was a, the Pew Research Center did a study asking people of various ages, a total of about 3,000 people, would you say that you are very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy? And frankly, across the ages, it was pretty similar. Uh, perhaps some people, once they were middle aged and above, there was a there was a certain higher number that were would report not too happy. But most people were very happy or pretty happy. That doesn't change that much. Very interesting. Also, in the same survey, was what people under sixty five expected about aging and what people over 65 reported about what they were experiencing in aging. So this speaks to our earlier myth, but over 57% of younger people, or 57% thought that um, their memory loss was a feature of being older, and about 25% were actually experiencing that. That's actually high, so probably some of those people weren't, you know, technically didn't have memory loss. Um, again, not able to drive, having a serious illness, not being sexually active, feeling sad or depressed, not feeling needed, being lonely, trouble paying bills, and being a burden. And in all of these, that the, the number of people actually reporting that was much lower. And then what about if you actually ask people about their well-being? So this is an interesting way to get at well-being, is asking people if you're on a ladder for that the bottom is zero and 10 is the top, and you're thinking about your best possible life at the very top and the worst possible life at the bottom, where are you on that ladder? And actually, it sort of dips in middle age, but people are pretty satisfied. They report pretty good well-being as they get older. These are all just different ways to uh, getting at it. So when you actually, and this was, sorry, this was 340,000 people were surveyed in this. So that's a pretty robust survey. Um, I shudder to think how they were able to complete that survey. Um, so there's a lot to say that people in there who are older aren't reporting being unhappy. Um, I think there's some real challenges with growing older that people who are older also speak to. And so I, I want to touch on these briefly. Um, does, do people know Donald Hall? He's a, he's a poet. He's still an active writer, now mostly writes prose, and he published a book about essays after 80. And 
really he sort of describes which with what at one point he describes a as a ceremony of losses that's what that's what these essays are about so it's not to discount the fact that in later years there can be a cumulative effect of multiple losses. In his case, he suffered physical disability and was having trouble with mobility and ended up using a wheelchair to for his mobility. He had several chronic health conditions that were seriously impacting function. He lost his wife. Actually, what's somewhat interesting about him, he lost her m many years earlier, but he writes about it as if it's a very present thing. She was understandably very important to him. And he wrote a great essay where he outlined how he lost respect of his community. And this is where I want to start to pivot what we're talking about, about what we can do as we get older and what we can do as individuals to affect how we age and our experience of aging. And to think a little bit also about what our community can do, what we as a community can do for older people that can maybe improve the experience of aging. So he talks about going to a museum with a colleague, I believe, who was pushing his wheelchair for him to make it a little easier to get around the museum. And here he is, poet laureate, very distinguished writer of an incredible intellect. And the, one of the museum staff sort of crouched down and looked him in the eyes and said, did you have a nice, um, a nice din din? And, he, you know, just, yes, exactly. I'm sure he wanted, I think essentially he smacked them in this essay. Um, and let them know what he thought uh, about, um, you know, and his thoughts expressing it in this essay. But just the fact that, you know, this the phenomenon I think of treating older people as as infants at times um, was really painful for him. And so there is a phenomenon that that is increasingly being studied about loneliness, and that was one of the things that was asked about in the Pew study. So I wanted to bring it up because it is notable in older age, and it's a f increasing focus. And so we know that compared to prior generations, more older people live alone than they used to, and it's particularly true for women. So um, women over 75 are are. Uh, more often live alone than don't. And so that, of course, doesn't mean you're lonely by any means, but it's a risk factor. And in some studies, uh, up to 43% of people in the community who are older have reported feeling lonely, so over 65. So that feels like a pretty high prevalence. So this made me wonder, however, because we do focus on it a lot and we focus on the health outcomes of loneliness, such as um, uh, mental health consequences, health consequences, and actually higher mortality rates in people who say they're lonely compared to those who don't. But I was like, well, are, is that just a feature of older age, just because we talk about it all the time in older age? And there was a study that looked at, this was a German study, so I don't know how similar we feel to Germans, but um, or how much we want to compare ourselves to Germans. But when they ask people across the lifespan, so from their 20s to 100 years old, it, about loneliness, it looked in the raw scores that they were reporting more loneliness in older age, but then when they controlled for all the variables like um, function and health, um, just a way to sort of even it out. There's actually sort of peaks of loneliness in life. So in um, 30s, 60s, and then in older age, but it's not necessarily that much higher when you're older. However, that doesn't mean it's not important. And in fact, uh, looking across the um, large lake of the Atlantic Ocean, in England, they have a campaign against loneliness. So they're a little ahead of us on this, but they really focus on the health impacts of loneliness. And again, in, in my interest in sort of pivoting us to think a little bit about community solutions, um, they have a framework by which they're trying to address loneliness as a community. So that framework includes thinking about the structure of the community. So what are neighborhood approaches, um, community development approaches, volunteer approaches, that can impact aging, um, sorry, loneliness. Um, we know transportation and technology, improving those, access to those for older people impacts loneliness. Um, direct interventions for people as well, um, helping them make new connections, build str stronger existing relationships, and then um, foundational services for all of us, which is just trying to reach out to older people, understand their 
what they're going through and support them appropriately. But that the fact that there's a lot of societal and structural parts to this intervention I think is really important. Um, because I really think we're getting to the point where we understand that certainly health-wise, function-wise, you know, yes, life planning, there's lots of things you can do to improve your experience of aging overall and maybe to age better, whatever that means to you, or to live longer if that's important. But we, there's a, there's a trend now towards acknowledging and trying to plan aging and disability friendly communities and cities. So it's a whole movement and you can get certified. And I just wanted to plug and to say that San Francisco is engaged in that and they currently have an implementation work group for an aging and disability friendly city. So that involves the tech council, muni, um, uh, community organizations, uh, um, social services that have access to food and housing. Turns out housing is a tough problem in the city. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. But that, that is uh, unfortunately a really tough one. But, um, but they point out things like, you know, to also to just focus on disability and aging is undercutting what they're doing because a city that's inclusive and accessible help, really helps everybody. So if you can read signs better, if they're clearer, if the streets are easier to navigate, if the curbs are better and technology is e more easily accessible, that actually just helps everyone. So it's not even necessarily entirely um, all, of, it's, it's an all age friendly strategy in some ways. And so to point out some examples in the age friendly cities, as I mentioned, things they really focus on are transportation accessibility. Um, we'll see how, to what degree Uber and Lyft wanna start helping out. Um, it's access to technology and intergenerational programs, which are growing in the city. Access to health in different settings. So there's a huge movement to health in the home. So forget nursing homes, forget hospitals. All of that should be done in the home. So there's like a hospital at home movement. There's home-based primary care. Of course, that's appropriate in some settings and not others. Well, home-based primary care, Linda does home-based primary care. Um, but we are increasingly are admitting and realizing that clinics, hospitals, nursing homes are built for the people who work in them and not the people who are supposed to benefit from them. So taking those factors out of the actual health care we're trying to provide. Making the cities accessible, San Francisco has a lot of challenges around that, but making it aging and disability friendly. Um, and then this is one of my favorites. In the Netherlands, they have a program where because of housing crises for students who can't afford housing, actually setting up programs where they can live with older adults who might need some, some amount of assistance and either getting really discounted or free housing if they live with an older person and um, you know, respectfully provide help occasionally, um, but also companionship. And there's a lot of really cool things. Um, as usual, they're way ahead of us. And I, that's, that's where I'm gonna leave things. Um, many of you may not know, but we're in Older Americans Month right now, and there's a website at the Administration for Community Living, acl.gov, for Older Americans Month. And I will say that it's really focused on the stuff that you can do. So if you're looking for ways to engage in health, in learning more about security, financial security, volunteering, and just general info tip sheets, this is a good resource. So I want to make sure you saw it since this is Older Americans Month and um, they may have resources for you. But I think finally we're ready to take uh, end there and take your questions, which I know we're really looking forward to. So. Yes, I'm so sorry, yes, oam.acl.gov. All right, I'm so grateful for your attention. Thank you, really looking forward to your questions. Yes, sir. Yes, I'll make a brief comment. So the question was, how do things like Outlook or work on mindfulness and Outlook and, and positive thinking, and you had a different term, which was a good one, um, but things like that, how does that impact um, aging or how has that been looked at in aging? The, the basic thing I will say is, Obviously, mindfulness is really gaining steam. There's so many good resources for it. Things like resiliency, building resiliency, those things are 
all in terms of skill sets and way that we, ways that we can build our skills. Oh, and gratitude. You mentioned gratitude, which is a beautiful one and a really important one. There's no reason to think that you can't do those in older age. There's no reason not to work on those. I don't specifically know of research or work that has worked uh, focused only on older people, but I would I have seen some research that has shown that Outlook does have some impact on resiliency, like physical, psych physiologic resiliency in um, really stressful situations. But actually, a lot of the data shows that resiliency is higher in older people because cumulatively they've been through more things. So actually, resiliency is almost like a trained skill that a lot of older people have. So, and, and um, yeah, do you have any thoughts on that, Linda? No. Okay. So let's, yes, sir. So thank you, you've just asked my favorite questions. The first is, are medicines, so like number of medicines associated with getting older, basically, or increasing age? Oh yeah. So basically, we like to take your age, multiply it by two, divide it by three, and then make sure you're on at least that many prescriptions. <laughs> I, we, no, it's really, it's, it's really unfortunate. What we call, we call it, uh, prescribing cascade and prescribing inertia. So the new term, all the buzz is deprescribing. That's our number one mission when we work with older people is to see what extraneous, harmful, or no longer necessary medications are there. The problem is people get started on medications or they get started on medications by multiple providers who aren't talking and those stay on. So you should always be reassessing every single year, if not more often, uh, what medications you're on, if they're necessary. And then the main thing I look for is can we get rid of the medicine? If we can't get rid of the medicine, can we go down on the dose or the f how often that person's taking that medicine? Because the lower pill burden, the better. And medications, the number is associated, just the simple number, not even the type, with a lot of really unfortunate things like falls, uh, decreasing function. So we really try to um, minimize medications, but it is absolutely true that older people are on the most medicines. Um, and then the second question was we should, all of these, excuse me, graphs are obsolete because 65 is an absolutely unuseful number for saying when somebody's old. Mm -hmm. I spent the whole time saying how chronology is not that helpful. We want to know how people are doing functionally and overall in terms of well-being and, you know, daily activities. So I could not agree with you more, but unfortunately we have inherited this cutoff of 65 and there's some utility to it. Clearly some things are associated with being 65 or older, but it does, it's not as meaningful as we're pretending it is. And I think we would have to agree with you on that. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So the book I am blanking on the author as well. Happiness is a choice. If I'm not mistaken, that's the same gentleman who he published these profiles or at least some of them in the new, in new York times. He, these are all New Yorkers, um, uh, older, old, so over 85 New Yorkers and sort of their stories. And it, it is a, um, I read a lot of them or some of their profiles in the paper and yeah, these are just remarkable people. It's completely wonderful to, to learn from them and his stories are really good. And I, I think, absolutely, I think it, it speaks a lot to the resilience, and I think that's a wonderful recommendation. Mm -hmm. And a long weekend's coming up, so we've got the time to read this story. <laughs> and if you buy, buy your, your subscription, not prescription, to the New York Times, maybe you can find it there. Yes, sir. Yes. The question is, does is there a decline in immune function as we age? And yes, there is. The term for that's called immune senescence. And so what it means is, that as we age, our immune system is not able to mount as vigorous of a response when, they, when the body's faced with an infection, for example. It doesn't mean that the body cannot respond, but the response is not as strong and it may be somewhat delayed. So a clinical example of that is, is that um, older adults may not develop a fever even if they have pneumonia, whereas a younger person would. So that's a good question. I'm going to let Anna answer that one. I got the easy part. So the question was, is there anything that can be done to strengthen the immune system? So I think some things um, are already done. So just uh, one quick example clinically as well, vaccines for older people, mm -hmm. the flu vaccine and the zoster mm -hmm. vaccine for shingles will be a higher dose than they are for younger people to be sure to stimulate a response. As far as I know, there's no clear 
road to improving the immune system specifically. This is going to sound a little strange, but in some ways it's actually a gift because a lot of damage from the immune response is avoided. So pneumonia isn't as painful. Urinary tract infections aren't as painful. Um, so you want a good clinician to be able to detect if you have a problem and help you get treatment. But in, in some regards, it's also adaptive in that it's not the vigorous immune response that you normally get, you know, isn't quite as damaging either. So now we know there's this sort of balance between the, the needing the immune system to help you get rid of infections or even cancers, things like that. And then, not ha and then the damage it does and leaves behind when it goes you know, guns a blazing. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we're not, but we don't actually have targeted therapies for that. So the question, the follow-up question was, um, you know, actually can preserving the immune system or strengthening the immune system actually help with avoiding needing some of the medications we need to, uh, combat disease. And, um, I'm going to have to punt again that I'm, I'm not actually sure what we can do. I mean, I think the basic things we do to preserve immune system are really, it's going to be a little bit um, embarrassingly simple, but like good nutrition, sleep, you know, uh, regular exercise, those things actually do are shown. And then, oh, hand washing, believe it or not, you know, just to prevent infection in the first place, doing all those standard things are, are helpful. Um, there's... Uh, but it's a good question. I'll actually follow up with, I don't know if you heard last week, but I'll follow up with Dr. Newman, who, who may have some additional information. Whew, that's a good question. Does autoimmunity decline as you get older? Because obviously uh, the autoimmune response is the unwanted uh, attack of the immune response on our own body. Unfortunately, no. We have a different, we see different autoimmune diseases in older adults, but we still see autoimmune disease. Like rheumatoid arthritis doesn't get better, you know, things like that. Psoriasis is autoimmune, has an autoimmune component. Um, there, there are things like different kind of uh, inflammation of blood vessels that actually we see more, or, or skin diseases that cause um, blisters that are even more common in older people. So I'm not sure that, unfortunately, we do see a decline in autoimmune disease, which is an, a bummer. Yes, sir. So, oh, great question. The question was, here in San Francisco, we have a great infrastructure, public health infrastructure, where we have a lot of nurses, and those folks are front lines to provide health care to older people. I'm going to let the nurse answer this question, but it would be, <laughs> it would be my vote that absolutely we need a, a frontline workforce. Yeah. Um, I'm going to let... I'll say very briefly, because I don't think it's my role to make all the comments, but we definitely are a little prideful in geriatrics that we're very interprofessional. We are not, we're not into having the physician as the center of the universe or even the primary provider, like the nurse practitioner as the center of the universe. We actually work, put a lot of emphasis on social work, mm -hmm. um, you know, home health workers. You know, we consider all those people our team, the community pharmacist. Mm -hmm. We're trying to work more directly with community pharmacy. So this is, it's a team effort all the way. And I think that is actually a core teaching of geriatrics because the medical stuff actually often needs to get de-emphasized to improve health and well-being because we run the risk of what you call iatrogenesis, like our health care being the problem, not the solution, um, or causing more good harm than good. But I would love Linda to talk a little bit about this. Oh, I'll, I'll just make one self-serving comment is that one of the things that I really enjoy about being a nurse is um, the definition of nursing is the diagnosis and treatment of human responses to illness. And I feel like being a nurse and working in geriatrics, that comes to its full fruition. But I totally agree with what Anna was saying is that geriatrics is really, I think, one of the best areas for interprofessional collaboration because it takes a team to provide really good care to older adults. The other thing we're putting a lot of emphasis on, and actually my time here this evening, or I should say my time to prepare the talk this evening was funded by a grant from the federal government to train frontline folks in geriatrics principles, but not necessarily be specialists because we're not going to have enough specialists. So the, that that ship has sailed already. So we have about 7,000 geriatricians in the country with the 
large increase, not natural disaster tsunami, but large increase in older people that we're going to have in our country, we know that, that that's a huge shortfall by at least at least low ball estimate, 23,000. If you wanted a geriatrician to provide care to every older person or even every older person that had, who was over 85, or you would say had geriatric needs. So that, that ship has sailed. So that's exactly what we want to do. And what I would call that is decentralization. We want the front lines to really hold the knowledge and the, and the skills. So that is actually what we have a grant to do and we're, and we're working on. So Linda's part of our grant and that's how we get to work together um, in doing education. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, this gentleman's comment, and it's going to be our last comment, and then we'll wrap up, and we will definitely stick around for more discussion if you have time and interest. But his comment was really, you know, we all have lapses in memory sometimes, and, you know, why so much emphasis on that, and that the brain is a sort of a more complex organ than that, and I would just completely agree. Mm -hmm. It was a little simple for us to focus on memory. There's a lot of cognitive domains in the brain, and we're learning so much, including how things like music or dance or other kinds of body movement can access parts of our brain that were otherwise uh, seemingly flagging um, in general interaction. I want to thank you so much for your time, and I really look forward to seeing you next week and look forward to speaking more with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you.